Okay. Uh, that looks like 10 a.m. to me. So uh, let's get started then. Um, for those uh, who I think are first coming to KBS or for all of those watching online, um, my name is Dr. Sadiq Mohammed. I'm a lecturer in uh, organizational behavior and HRM at the University of Kent. And uh, today I have a, um, I would hope, interesting uh, lecture for you um, on the topic of becoming manager on the challenges facing managers in contemporary organizations. Um, I'm going to say a little bit later about why I picked that as a title. Uh, but uh, for now, what I want to kind of reflect on is uh, firstly, who I am, and then uh, we'll get into uh, the lecture. Okay, let's get our subtitles going. Uh, all right. So my background is um, not, I think, typical for most business school academics. My background is in critical theory. Uh, I'm part of a unique little subgroup within organization studies, which we call critical management studies. Critical management studies isn't interested in how to make business more effective or more efficient or um, more productive. Rather, it's interested in a very simple, uh, simple, uh, let's say different series of questions uh, around whether uh, management is ethical, whether it's moral, what it's uh, taken for granted consequences are, what problems it creates. In a 2002 paper, Adler and company describe it as follows. They look at the, I guess, broad and diverse array of topics that critical management academics study and consider that the common core of all of these different areas is a deep skepticism regarding the moral defensibility and social and ecological sustainability of prevailing conceptions and forms of management and organization. Now, this is very interesting, I think, because uh, it gets us to not think about, well, what, how do we maximize our efficiency? But rather, we're reflecting on consequences. You know, you might implement some kind of, say, performance management system, and that might make your employees more productive, sure. But what else does it cause? Does it cause burnout, stress? Does it ruin the team dynamics of the organization as everyone is competing to suddenly be the best employee? These are the kinds of questions that CMS is interested in. Uh, and I just want everyone to keep that line of questioning in mind because what I'm going to talk about today isn't going to be interesting if all you want is to know how to improve your bottom line. Rather, it's going to be interesting if you want to think about the unintended consequences of how we think about and practice management. Specifically, there's a very simple question that I want to reflect on today. Uh, who are managers? Um, what do we know about them? A quick Google search will tell us that uh, there are certain culturally accepted images that correspond to management, right? It's usually someone uh, who's besuited, most likely male, um, and they're, they're a giver of instructions, yeah? We can see a Google image search in the background here. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of shared cultural lexicon, a discourse, we might say, of what it means to be and perform oneself as a manager. Uh -huh. Many of us, most of the time, we find ourselves performing this image and trying to conform to it. Uh, but there are many more images than just these. And what I want to do today is think about some of these images and think about their unintended consequences. One of the most popular and prevalent images of management that we see is the image of the manager as an engineer of work, 
someone whose job it is to study how work is done, to try to understand uh, the nature of the process, to break it down into a number of um, subdivided skills uh, that can be uh, performed by individuals with less skill, if that makes sense. So the classic example is something like the Fordist factory, right? Uh, we see, for example, in the Fordist factory that uh, Henry Ford looks at the entire process of assembling an automobile and sees that, well, I can break it down into a number of uh, discrete steps. Instead of having one guy um, attach a tire and then pick up a wrench and then pick up the lug nuts and tighten them on, I can have one guy put the tie in place, one guy put the lug nuts on, and another guy do the wrenching. That's very interesting because the car moves along and the people are just functional arms completing a process. Now, in this vision of management, the manager is, is interestingly detached. Yeah? Uh, they are monitoring and observing. They are surveilling. Uh, for people like Frederick Taylor, the pioneer of what many of us come to know as scientific management, uh, this is what management is about. It's about studying and refining and perfecting a process of work so as to make it most efficient, to have as little waste as possible. But already we can start to see an unintended consequence. Uh, the consequence being that if you break down a process, you take all of the skill out of it, it becomes boring, dull, dumb, alienating work that people have to then do. Uh, you know, there used to be um, jokes around working at Ford where people would be considered uh, like five day workers. You know, they show up for five days, they work, and then they realize how alienating and shit the work is, and then they leave, right? Uh, we'll get to what that tells us about contemporary organizations in a bit. But for now, we can see that problematic beginning to emerge, treating workers almost as um, automatons or robots create certain issues, right? Equally problematic, however, is another image of management one that emerges in sort of the mid 20th century where management is conceived not as this uh, kind of engineer who is studying the process of work, but rather uh, as a manipulator of the human heart, someone interested in people's motives, their psychological drives, their social needs. Uh, one important thinker in this tradition, and there are many, uh, is someone called Elton Mayo. Um, Mayo in the, I think, 1920s and 30s uh, is part of a number of experiments at Hawthorne Electric uh, plant in the US, where workers are studied as they perform a number of um, broken down sort of machine-like tasks. Uh, and what the team at Hawthorne concludes is that there is more going on than just a need for monetary compensation. And there is more going on than just a need to study the process and make it efficient. Uh, people have social needs. They have um, a complex array of motives and drives. In Mayo's own words, he says the following. Important factors in the production of a better mental attitude and greater enjoyment of work have been greater freedom, less strict supervision, and the opportunity to vary from a fixed pace without reprimand from a gang boss. Almost the opposite of what we might infer from uh, people like Ford and Taylor. But note again that this is quite a flattering image of management, right? It's one where the manager is this. Um, uh, almost a uh, psychoanalyst or counselor figure 
who is able to see into the heart of human beings and understand what drives and motivates them. Uh, these flattering images, I think, uh, come to a head in the 1987 film Wall Street. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of uh, the age of my audience and that many people will not have seen this film. So quick summary. Um, in the film, set on Wall Street, <laughs> Michael Douglas plays the inimitable Gordon Gecko. Gecko is a, a ruthless corporate raider who um, buys up companies and then sells off their assets in order to maximize his own revenues and gains, regardless of what that means for the people working at these organizations. He doesn't care. Uh, at the center point of the film, Gecko gives a famous speech where he says, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed cuts through and clarifies, uh, and captures some kind of essence of the revolutionary spirit. Greed as a motive for management, right? Um, Now, what becomes interesting for me is to reflect on this image of managers, right? Someone motivated by greed to maximize their own rev revenue and wealth. This uh, Machiavellian master of the universe, able to control stock markets and predict far into the future what share prices will be. It's a seductive image, right? Particularly if you're. Um, you're in a business school. Indeed, uh, in a 2010 article for the Financial Times, Francesco de Guerrera uh, interviews a number of uh, bankers on Wall Street. Uh, and many of them speak overtly about how influential the film was for them, right? Uh, one says, the film became a cult phenomenon on business school campuses. Uh, after they joined the industry, Many young traders told me that they watched it so many times, I thought they knew more about Gordon Gecko than their families. Interesting, right? The seductive image of a manager as being in control, this powerful figure, a master of the universe. Well, how true is that image? How true are any of these images? Uh, when we look at what we might think of as the reality of managerial experience in the contemporary social milieu, this is not quite what we see. Uh, one um, anonymous supermarket manager uh, reporting um, or writing for The Guardian in 2016 describes their work not as this uh, sexy process of controlling the world, but uh, as follows. It's not about making money. Uh, by far the most rewarding part of my job is being able to make a difference in so many people's lives. It can be something as simple as explaining to a customer how to choose a good melon or ensuring that they can find any item at any time of day. This person isn't describing being a uh, powerful manipulator of men and they're not describing uh, being a kind of engineer studying the work process. They talk about getting up at 4.30 to make it to work at 6 a.m., uh, doing 12-hour days plus weekends. They talk about feeling guilty that their employees aren't making enough money. They talk about work feeling like a second home because they're always there. Uh, they talk about dealing with absent employees by just doing their job, stocking shelves. Uh, they talk about being required to be obsessed over metrics and targets because their bosses are obsessed over metrics and targets. Read in that way, management isn't this incredibly sexy profession at all. It's, uh, it's one riven with uh, tensions, with uncertainties and with anxieties over uh, how one should be doing what it is one is doing and whether one is doing the right thing. 
This, very interestingly, is reflected in the academic research. Uh, there's a great paper by Amanda Hay in 2014, where she interviews a number of managers and asks them about what their experience of managing and becoming a manager is like. Uh, Hay finds that the images constructed by these managers aren't like the ones we've been seeing of power, prestige, and control. Rather, they're of people announcing with horror that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, here's one manager speaking. This is talking from quite bitter experience. When I first got made manager, they give you the title. You're a manager, carry on. And the one difference in training to be a manager between the Friday and the Monday was I had a different car park pass. You are a manager. They just assumed you could do it. So you've got no support, which means that you were managing badly because you don't know what you're doing. You're making it up as you go along, which also means that you don't have a lot of confidence in your role or your abilities to do it. Hmm. That doesn't sound quite so uh, competent and in control. Uh, this person speaking here is, is no master of the universe. They're nervous. They're uncertain. They're struggling to figure out what's happening. Here's another one. When you first go into a managing role, you are quite nervous by the whole process of leading people and think, I'm not going to be very good at this. But I think sometimes you do have to stretch yourself because when I came into this position, I felt out of my depth and it probably took two or three months to structure things in my head that I can do this and I've been picked because I can do this. Notice here, this person is constructing a kind of story for themselves, right? One where they legitimate their own abilities uh, to convince themselves, yes, okay, I can do this. I'm I've been chosen for this role because I, I can do it, right? They wouldn't have picked me if I couldn't do it. Uh, this is an interesting convincing that's going on. It's what we would call identity work, right? People are confirming to themselves that they can perform this identity of manager, right? But note that there's a horrible catch-22 going on here, and he points it out uh, that... The feelings of uncertainty and anxiety that one has about one's identity as a manager makes one feel uncertain and anxious about one's identity as a manager. You sit there thinking to yourself, uh, gosh, well, managers know what they're doing, right? When I, when I look at images of management on the TV or on Google, they all seem in control and in command. Um, but I have no idea. Oh, gosh, I feel like crap about myself now. What do I do? So you, you feel anxious about the fact that you feel anxious. <laughs> it's, really, it's really bleak, right? It's really depressing. But what are you going to do? Uh, the, the conclusions, I guess, of his paper are, are quite striking in this regard, I think. It, it's that management is not this um, incredibly... Uh, powerful, controlling uh, force within organization. Rather, as one manager says, I can't believe I'm saying this, but as manager of a big team, you have to put on this something. It's almost like being an actor, isn't it, to a certain extent? You play the audience, depending on who they are. I know this is against what I'm supposed to be saying, but I guess I always feel half the time I'm pretending putting on a face that isn't quite the real me, isn't what I talk about when I get home or what I do. It's quite a relief to go, phew, I don't have to worry or think about anybody else at the end of the day. Performance. Yeah? Putting on a mask or a face. Uh, hiding your self-doubt and uncertainty uh, and all the emotional labor that that entails having to bottle that uh, existential 
uh, struggle in order to present yourself in a certain way. Uh, but this is not the kind of thing that generally gets spoken of in a business school, right? Uh, as you go through your studies, you will see lots of uh, images of management as this confident controller. And you'll learn all kinds of statistical techniques and performance management strategies to embody that role. But here, he is giving us a glimpse of something uh, that I think is fundamental to all of our experiences. Anyone who's had um, experience of management will, will vouch for this, yeah? that you put on this kind of performance, this kind of uh, fake identity of management that's imbued with all of these discursive markers, you know, uh, and we'll come back to this. Now, the question that interests me really, really particularly is what happens with all of this anxiety, all of this uncertainty, right? Does it, does it just stay there, sort of? Um, well, no. What happens is that... Uh, it becomes very easy for certain figures and individuals to step in to the realm of organizations and present that they have the solution. They know what's going on. Huh? You're scared and uncertain? Don't worry about it. I can fix it. Uh, we call these people management gurus. Um, in a very interesting paper in 1998, uh, Clark and Salomon describe the management guru as someone who is involved with the presentation of ambitious claims to transform managerial practice, organizational structures and cultures, and crucially, performance, through the recommendation of a fundamentally almost magical cure or transformation that rejects the past, reinvents the organization and its employees, their relationships, attitudes, and behavior. Someone swoops in and says to you, look, I, I know you're not certain about this whole management thing. I know you feel like you don't know what you're doing. I know you feel like you're just putting on a performance. Uh, let me help you, you know, just, just for a little bit of, just, just a little, little bit of money. Just, you know, just, just pay my exorbitant fees and I'll tell you how to run your organization. This is a huge industry. Uh, and you can see the sort of tip of the iceberg of it. Every time you go to an airport or a train station bookshop and you wander into the business and management section, you'll see autobiographies of great managers or great leaders. You'll see um, some person or other giving you advice on how to manage chaos or whatever it is that the new vogue of the day is. This is the tip, right? Uh, below that is a nexus of consulting and uh, general advice practice that um, is incredibly lucrative. Uh, a couple of years ago, I became particularly interested in one figure, uh, Tim Ferriss. Some of you may know him. Um, now, let me say there are much better examples of management gurus, right? Um, Tom Peters is, I think, uh, the best. And if you want to see a management guru in action, he's the person to look at. Uh, but I became quite interested in Ferris. He has a number of books like um, The 4-Hour Work Week, uh, The 4-Hour Chef, uh, designed to make your life more efficient, right? Uh, but his 2016 book in particular caught my eye. It's called Tools of Titans, right? Uh, it contains about 100 profile chapters where he interviews some kind of visionary leader or person of note whose characteristics and qualities you can be expected to emulate. It's everyone from um, PhDs in neuroscience to bodybuilders like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Uh, it's the whole gamut of people. Uh, and Ferris says something quite interesting. He says, these world-class performers don't have superpowers. The rules that they've crafted for themselves allow the bending of reality to such an extent that it may seem that way, 
but they've learned how to do this, and so can you. Bending of reality. We think back to Clark and Salomon, an almost magical cure. Yeah? Uh, the life advice that you find in this book is quite interesting. You can find anything from uh, advice on how to make good eggs to how to buy a mattress to how to deal with haters, right? Uh, banal, mundane stuff. And I became really, really interested in, in why people would be at all concerned with this kind of mundane advice. Uh, and what I, I think part of my conclusion was that it is a response to uh, all of this uncertainty around how to be a manager, right? around these different images and the discord between them. Uh, I phrase it like this in a paper published very recently. Ferris's work seems to offer a clear response to the perilous politics of identity, power, and anxiety that governs modern life in the general context of late capitalism. Follow these instructions and you'll be fine. Here, Ferris is to be truly admired for the ways in which the text actively constructs the reader, an individual in organization struggling for a sense of purpose or direction, likely to be enchanted by stories of titans who were successful through a series of habits or qualities that we too can cultivate. Yeah? Ferris's whole MO is selling you life advice. Uh, and I know that this is life advice that is attractive to future managers because more than one of my students has walked into my class carrying this book over the years. Uh, and you never know quite what to say. Now, I should qualify, since we're thinking critically about all of this, that what I've said so far kind of paints the management guru or the consultant, the person offering the life advice as a kind of predatory figure. Someone who is involved in uh, trying to take advantage of managers and their uncertainty. Uh, but there is a kind of complicity there. There is a kind of desire to be told what to do. Uh, David Collinson talks about this in a 2003 paper where he draws upon the work of Frankfurt School critical theorist Eric Fromm. Uh, Fromm writes in a, a quite noteworthy book about the fear of freedom, that at times when offered uh, endless freedom, the possibility to be whoever we want to be or claim whatever we want to claim, we recoil, we retreat from freedom. Now, this sounds like a strange idea, right? How would you retreat from freedom? Or why? Freedom's a great thing. Uh, Collinson says the following. On the one hand, openness can provide individuals with increased freedom, since they may now exercise much more discretion over what they do, how they do it, and who they want to be. Yet, on the other hand, this greater openness can be highly threatening. It can significantly increase individuals' sense of insecurity and vulnerability. You know, many of us have had this experience, right? You're standing in the supermarket and there's like 50 different kinds of cereal and you're just looking at it going, well, shit, which one do I want? So you default to different kinds of habits or intellectual shortcuts in order to avoid the choice, to relinquish the freedom. This is the same thing here. You could be whatever kind of manager you want to be, but you're not sure what is the right kind. What do people want me to be? What will be most productive or most successful? Right? And so we invite the guru in. We seek out their advice. Just tell me who to be. Just tell me what to do. Uh, and so there is this complicity worth noting. Now, what all of this sketches is, again, to return to it, our question, who are managers, is not figures in control, but rather uh, figures 
uncertain, unsure, afraid even. Uh, in his 2015 book, oh, no, 2017, confusing it with another book. Um, in his 2017 book, Peter Fleming extends the scope of this crisis uh, to suggest that it's not just about uncertainty, uh, but that managerial work is, is killing us. Uh, that management exists in a kind of crisis. He gives us a, an interesting example. It says simply, man dies at office desk. Nobody notices for five days. Fleming notes this kind of mythic and apocryphal story, right? Because we're, we're not sure where it comes from or whether it's true. Uh, and he notes it precisely because it's interesting that we keep telling it. You hear it and you think, yeah, someone dies in the office and nobody noticed. Of course, that's true. Uh, but the fact that we keep telling it is interesting. Uh, it speaks to not only the prevalence of death by overwork, uh, I think the, the most recent numbers I saw was that by 2015, Japan had claims to over 2,300 deaths from overwork. And the problem is equally prevalent uh, here in the UK. Well, perhaps not equally, but still prevalent. Um, but Fleming observes something else. Uh, that work has become not a, a tool for freedom, but something dangerous. He says, employment today is one of the leading causes of distress for simple reasons. It has become connected to everything in one's life and one's fortunes depend entirely upon it. The malaise affecting working people today is different. Many have discovered that having a job is increasingly a path into hardship rather than out of it. The high price of commuting, rent, childcare, all of these other things we need to get by in order in an over-privatized social universe means that in-work poverty is rife. Work isn't this great liberatory thing anymore, Fleming is suggesting. Rather, uh, it is deeply boring oppressive uh, as we we go to work in order to have something to do to make money so that we can keep working just think about the story again you know man dies at office desk nobody notices for five days how useless is your job that nobody notices that you haven't been doing it for five days Uh, Fleming talks about the rise of what uh, David Graeber calls bullshit jobs, jobs that even the people doing them know they're boring and useless, right? Uh, and much of contemporary management is enrolled in this kind of boring job because we've, we've turned management into, for example, an engineer of work someone who has to study performance metrics. But when you're sitting looking at spreadsheets all day, you're divorced and disconnected and bored. Yeah? The flip side is also true. You're listening to people's problems all day. Well, that's not very interesting, is it? So here we see a very different image of management, right? One that's not this sexy master of the universe, one that is instead in crisis. Uh, now, why do, I, why do I tell you this? Um, I tell you this because it's been on my mind a lot recently. Um, the title for this lecture was kind of cribbed from a colleague of mine, Martin Parker, who in 2004 wrote a paper called Becoming Manager, or The Werewolf Looks Anxiously in the Mirror, Checking for Unusual Facial Hair. Martin likes style. Uh, in the paper, he talks about um, being given managerial responsibility, 
real power for the first time, power in a sense, uh, where he's made to be a uh, head of department. Now, Martin Parker is a critical management academic like I am. So he's aware of all the things I've been telling you. Uh, but this doesn't quite save him. Um, he speaks about the changes that happen in his life uh, as a result of becoming manager. And he chooses becoming manager as a term so as to avoid implying that management is a fixed or defined identity that can be quantified or pinned down. It's always something that one is approaching, right? something that one is always inadequate to. Uh, I recently took over as the director of studies of the BSc management program. So I'm in a similar position, having been given some degree of managerial authority, right? In practice, it's not very much. Uh, but I experienced something very similar to what Martin does. Uh, he says, uh, one of my worries was that everyone and everything would stop working. They would stand there and scratch their heads, and eventually one would turn to me and say, well, what do we do now? And I would blush and stammer and say, well, we'll just carry on doing whatever it was you were doing before. And they would look at me in a faintly disappointed way, having expected something like leadership to light up the room. They expected me to be confident and knowledgeable, and I was just me, still just me, when I needed to become a manager. This identity of management is, is looming in the background, right? Something you are supposed to be, but are always inadequate to, no matter how uh, much uh, awareness you have of the power and politics involved, or how much you know that there is this discursive image of management that is largely a fabrication that doesn't reflect reality. It doesn't matter. You're given a managerial role, and suddenly you feel this mixture of um, responsibility, like you're supposed to do something, uh, and simultaneous impotence, like you have no idea what you're supposed to do. And this is kind of what Parker is getting at. Uh, by the end of the paper, he's reflected extensively on uh, the nature of managerial work being bombarded with um, emails and requests for things, um, but also things I haven't quite experienced yet, like the joy of holding on to power uh, and being respected by his colleagues who um, call him Gov or my captain, my captain. Uh, he also talks about miscellaneous things like dressing the part. So he puts on a jacket. Uh, if you ever are fortunate enough to see Martin Parker, you'll see that he goes everywhere in varieties of Hawaiian shirts. Um, and so he dresses formally to meet higher people in the university, and he feels quite odd about that. Uh, he also talks about how it changes him and uh, makes him more authoritarian and controlling with his wife and children. And so he eventually comes to the question of why on earth anybody would want to do this? Why would anybody want to be a manager? He says overtly, uh, so why do good people do this? What principled madness leads them to believe they can hold such power within themselves? Perhaps they're bored with smaller lives, with lives spent writing and teaching. Perhaps they see the failings of their predecessors and believe that they could do better. Perhaps they weren't strong enough to refuse or were curious to taste the thin air at higher levels of the organization or felt it was their turn. Perhaps they have lots of children and need the money. Perhaps they want to escape from home, from themselves, from the emptiness. Perhaps they want to change the world. Perhaps they are not prince or princesses either and worry about the mirror. This image of the mirror is interesting because the, the idea being invoked is that at times he looks in the mirror and isn't quite sure he recognizes what he is becoming. Right? Uh, he's not sure that he wants to become manager uh, or that it's something he can separate himself from anymore. It's very interesting stuff, and, and I've been thinking a lot about that recently, which is kind of where this lecture is coming from, I think. Uh, now, a, <laughs> a reasonable question to ask might be, why on earth would I say any of this to a group of students, at least some of whom are presumably 
coming into a business school with the hope of being a manager at some point, right? Uh, whether you're studying a degree in management, you're on my program, BSc Management, or you are um, doing IB or accounting and you have ideas that at some point in the future you might be um, uh, in charge of people and managing. Uh, because this is a bleak and depressing reality that I've sketched out for you here, right? Uh, the reason I would say any of this to you is that um, my favorite poet, Andrea Gibson, says that uh, even when the truth isn't hopeful, the telling of it is. I like that. Uh, you know, most of you are going to go into organizations and make similar choices or be faced by similar choices to the ones I've sketched here. Do you choose to focus on performance metrics and targets, believing yourself to be a great engineer of work? Or do you try to manipulate and con people through a language of motivation, believing that you are responsible to make them love the work that they do, which you know might be boring or which you know they might be underpaid for? Do you hide the fact uh, that you have no idea what you're doing? Uh, or do you come out and say it openly? I pose these questions uh, so that you'll be disillusioned, I think. Disillusioned is a great word. Uh, it means both to disenchant and embitter, or to free or be freed from illusion. Uh, I think I like that. Staying disillusioned may, may, may well mean that you think about management in a different way, not as uh, heroes who are coming to save the day or powerful people uh, manipulating the world of organizations, but rather uh, as flawed. Um, subject to uh, other forms of management that you aren't seeing. Uh, insecure fuck-ups, just trying to make it through the day, right? Uh, in this sense, I think I'd encourage you to, as you go about your degrees, remain reflexive uh, about what is being suggested to you, these various images of management and to try to denaturalize the situations that you find yourselves in, in your futures in organizations, and think about to return to where we began with critical management studies, not how to make management or make your organization more efficient and productive, but to make it more ethical, to consider the unintended consequences of managerial practice. Uh, I think here we can see that uh, critical management studies has an important role in organizations, or in management education. Uh, perhaps that role might be in helping us to construct a more ethical future. Uh, I think I'd like to leave it there. Are there any questions? Uh, I can see in the chat that we don't have any. Um, Anybody wants to take a moment to think of one? Can happily consider it. Uh, I see your question, Rosie. Um, what advice would you give to someone looking to improve their management skills but lacking in confidence? Uh, I think I think if you're coming to me to ask for ways to improve your confidence. Uh, we are um where we might be barking up the wrong tree. Um, no, here's here's what I think, right? 
Um, this is indeed a pressing problem in contemporary organizations, right? And we can find various answers in everything from um, people teaching mindfulness to the police, to um, people with backgrounds in uh, acting, coming to give public speaking lessons, and so on, right? Uh, I think, however, a lack of confidence is important. It is part of being disillusioned. Staying with that troubling sensation of not knowing what you're doing, it's, I think, wrong to pathologize it, to say, oh, we must get rid of this. We must, uh, we must all feel good all the time. You know, this is how we end up with a Prozac culture, right? Uh, there are, uh, or there is, I think, value in staying with uh, that feeling of anxiety and uncertainty, um, staying disillusioned. Yeah? Uh, Tyler Franklin. To what degree does social conforming play a role in today's subject of management approaches? Conforming, yeah, definitely, um, plays a huge role. Uh, you know, uh, we see this a lot with um, uh, complaints from or concerns from BAME students, right? That uh, the images of management that we put up and perform are predominantly white, middle-class, besuited, uh, gray-haired men. And so uh, if you are the opposite of that, then you don't quite know what to conform to, right? Excuse me. Uh, we all like conforming, you know? It feels good. It feels... Um, feels right. No one likes being an outlier. Um, but again, that negative feeling of uncertainty of, uh, gosh, I, I don't quite know what image to conform to, how to be a manager, what being a manager looks like, is one we might want to hang on to. It tells us something important. Something's not quite right here. Huh? And if we're thinking critically, it's pointing out to us that uh, something is amiss. Something uh, could stand to be denaturalized or challenged in a, a anti-performative way. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Ooh. Okay, I see a very interesting one. Uh, do you think there is an intrinsic value in reading management and self-described guru books from the likes of uh, Tim Ferriss or Wilnick, or do you think it's more destructive and not conducive to managerial development? Also, I'm curious on your perspective of late capitalism in re relation to the popularity of said books. That's an amazing question. Um, so, uh, Andre Spicer, I think, and a number of other colleagues have been indulging experiments where um, they actually try to follow the strange advice being given uh, by people like Ferris and Co., right? Um, and it's weird. It's banal advice, and you don't know how to do it. It doesn't really seem to improve anything about your life, right? Um, I read it, or I read them, uh, largely because I was largely because I am a firm believer in what Werner Herzog says, right? Werner Herzog says, um, you must not avert your eyes. You must keep looking at popular culture, even when it seems horrible or malignant or repulsive. You must keep looking at it so that you can understand what it's trying to say or what it's asking for. Uh, and so, I, I read a bunch of management guru books. Uh, as to whether you as a student or prospective student should read it, um, I think it's up to you. I would advise you to take recommendations that you see there with a grain of salt uh, because 
they are designed to sell you stuff. And here we see the role of contemporary capital, right? Uh, capital will say and sell any idea if it thinks that doing so will lead to revenue maximization, right? Uh, capitalism will sell you the most radical, seemingly liberatory, um, free mode of existence, you know, uh, go out to the countryside and start a queer vegan commune, will sell you the seeds and the land to do that. And it can sell you the most uh, repressed, totalitarian, fascist existence imaginable. Um, these books are just a reflection of that. Yeah. Uh, and in that regard, we can also see the ways in which uh, capital is implicated in a promulgation of anxiety. Yeah. Uh, you know, contemporary marketing shows you that quite clearly. Nobody sells things by telling you you're happy and you don't need to buy anything, right? We sell stuff by telling you um, you're anxious, unfree, and inadequate, and so you need to buy our stuff to be happy. Um, buy our management guru books and you'll be happy, right? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I'm a lecturer here at Kent Business School. You can uh, feel free to email me if you're a student or even if you're not. Um, that's my email address on the screen. Uh, I'm happy to um, to talk about any of these things further or uh, pick up with anyone in anything they'd like to discuss. Um, yeah, if there's, uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, I think we can leave it there.